I know there's a lot of familiar faces here, but for those of you that I have not met yet, obviously I am Meg, um, and I'm from Toronto, Canada, which we all know, we're all living here, and I am the technology experience lead for Shopify. So I've spent the last two years leading the Ottawa team as well as Montreal, but I'm actually now moving back to Toronto to lead a few teams uh, on that side of Ontario, as well as Ireland and India, which is a new challenge. Prior to being at Shopify, I was with, uh, I was with Apple for about 11 years, which was a very long time, in uh, training, tech to support, leadership, and internal QA. So I already told you a little bit about me. Now, I don't know how much you guys know about Shopify, but I'll tell you a little bit about where I work. So we are the leading cloud-based multi-channel commerce platform. And merchants can use our software to design, to set up, to manage their stores across multiple channels. And this includes things like web, it includes mobile, social media, brick and mortar, because despite what you have heard, retail is not dead, uh, and as well as pop-up shops. And we are basically dedicated to making commerce better for everyone. And we really do mean everyone. So this means everyone from people like Diana, shouting her out, she has an amazing store, sells her own homemade pottery, all the way to merchants like uh, Kylie Cosmetics, Yeezy Supply, Fashion Nova, Penguin Books, and many, many more. Quite simply, we believe in taking the path that leads to more entrepreneurs. So just how many are we talking about? Well, we have 600,000 plus merchants using our platform, and that's in 175 countries around the world. Now, inside of Shopify, we have over 3,000 employees, and we're in six offices, plus remote employees in literally every corner of the world. And at Shopify, our culture is driven by six values. So the first is to be impactful. We always strive to find the simplest solutions, even, you know, you know well, we strive to find the simplest solutions to all problems, even the most complex ones. The second is be merchant obsessed. It's kind of obvious, it's kind of what we're all about, but we can only build the best products by relentlessly understanding their struggles, having deep care for them, and being committed to helping them succeed every step of the way. The third is to make great decisions quickly. To make great decisions, you need to gather some context. Thrive on change. We know change is constant, and we benefit from things like shock and chaos. And we'll get a little bit into that later, but... And also being a constant learner. So since we know that change is constant, we need every single person at Shopify to be a perpetual and a deliberate learner. And finally, build for the long term. We want to be a 100-year company, and I want to have a team that lasts 100 years. So we need to build solutions that will stand the test of time. Now, these things are not just values, right? They're what Shopify values, and we embody them in every single thing that we do. All of these are factors in our get shit done mentality. So while these apply to us, I'm positive that those of you in the, the crowd that are having growth on your teams can probably identify with some of these. Now, my team at Shopify is called Technology Experience. We're not your average basement dwelling, IT crowd esque team telling people to turn things on and off again, although we do tell people to turn things on and off again, but we really do shape the experience of what technology at Shopify is like. So we work with teams to overhaul their tooling uh, to help them be able to ship things faster. We provide kick-ass support to all Shopify folk, including our massive remote team and a whole lot more that we can totally get into at the break. We also work really closely with security-focused teams within the trust team. Now, by the way, like Matt says, you guys are really lucky because you have two people from Shopify that are speaking at this conference, so make sure you're here for Diana's talk tomorrow because it is awesome. So this talk, now the idea from it, or the idea for it rather, came about after discussing with a colleague on my team about what it looked like for our team to have their heads above water. It was a particularly challenging time. And so we talked about what it looked like to have our heads above water, what it looked like to have our heads underwater, and how generally how to learn how to swim during different, phrases of, uh, different phases of growth that we were experiencing. And so I kind of thought to myself, what actually does it look like? So I think it looks a little like this. <laughs> Maybe you are floating away in a lazy river, you've got a drink in your hand with a little umbrella, nothing's on fire, everything's automated perfectly, there are zero tickets in the queue, fingers crossed. It's like a utopia, right? But the reality is, that most of the time, it feels a lot like this. Systems that are breaking for no reason whatsoever, you have repairs piling up, maybe they're in the hundreds, 
workflows that worked a month ago just no longer work. Hopefully your notifications on Slack are not in the double or triple digits. But during growth like this, it can be super, super difficult to stay afloat. Sometimes it can even feel like your head is not above water at all, which can be a little bit of a scary feeling. So it's safe to say that with, you know, growth can come some growing pains. When speaking about growth, Tim Westergren, who founded Pandora, said this, just be prepared for a long and often uncertain journey. The good stuff doesn't come easy, and boy was he right. So when you're a small team or company, a uh, majority of your things tend to work as expected. Basically, they work as they're designed to work. But as you start to grow a little bit more, maybe they don't work so hot anymore. Uh, for example, for us, our ticketing workflow needs to be completely reevaluated to account for new escalation paths, or our strategy for account creations and onboarding completely breaks due to the sheer number of people we're hiring. Once you grow a lot more than that, you kind of start to feel like that last emoji guy up there. And I want to give you uh, an example of one of the biggest areas of opportunity for us as we started to grow. And that was repair and inventory management, or lack thereof. So <laughs> a long time ago, um, our team was literally using post-it notes to label what we were doing with machines. So before we had any a type of NDM solution, we were using things like Google Sheets. So if things in our environment were broken, we threw a post-it note on it. If it needed a repair, we put a post-it note on it. We literally were making it rain post-it notes. And when I started at Shopify, I was convinced that someone must have had stock in 3M because there was no explanation. They were literally on everything. And this solution wasn't, it wasn't born out of any type of laziness, despite what you may think, but rather it was a Band-Aid solution to a problem that straight up nobody had any time to fix. I think at the time around this, uh, there were maybe less than 10 people on the team and we were supporting a company already in the thousands. So safe to say things were a little tight. But there were a lot of warning signs during this time that this was going to become a bigger, bigger issue. But due to things like, again, not enough people, not enough time, maybe even lack of skills, they were straight up ignored. So just when you thought you saw the last of Postnits, you see they're everywhere here. And I made a joke before about this. If we had like an amazing HVAC system and it blew all the Post-it notes, we would literally have been screwed. Um, I spoke too soon. That was not that long ago and I saw another Post-it. It was terrifying. So we knew we needed to get shit done. So we put on our thinking caps and this is what we came up with at the time that revolutionized everything for us, a Google Sheet. So you can almost hear the sarcasm in my voice here, but imagine for every pair, you open this up, you copied and pasted the serial number into it, you referenced whatever information from the JSS you needed, you copy and pasted all of that separately. This was not ideal, obviously, but we were able to get some shit done with this. It was a nice little Band-Aid solution. And then we decided it was time to get shit fixed. So here's what we did. Get Shit Fix is a homegrown Rails app made by our senior IT specialist, Merrick. Now, this is a really great example of someone being a perpetual learner and applying that to 10x the rest of their team. What's really fantastic about this tool is it's actually encouraged other people that are on the team to start learning things like Ruby and help continue to build more features out, as well as other things as well. So with Get Shit Fixed, we do a lot of stuff. It's kind of our one-stop shop. We run reports, we run audits from it, and those get sent to Slack on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, depending on what we're auditing. Uh, we typically do a bi-weekly jam blitz where we go through kind of our priority numbers and try to tackle them. Most importantly for me, it includes repair tools. So this now gives us the ability to create a traveler based off repair status, which then can append some extension attributes in the back end of the JSS. So for those um, offices where we don't really have a fully fledged TX member yet, this tool actually allows us to have, let's say the internal solutions person or the office coordinator, whoever owns inventory for that office, it gives them the ability to be able to accurately report and record stuff without actually needing to know Jamf or something like GSX. We also built out a tool to allow uh, GSF to help us monitor the health of our inventory. So with thousands of employees already working at the company and literally sometimes hundreds starting every month, uh, inventory can get a little out of hand pretty quickly. So being able to gamify the scores between these offices has actually been a really fun way to keep it top of mind, make it a little bit competitive, and make sure we're being as accurate as possible. 
It also has some really simple dashboards for metrics. Now, as a lead, I love metrics and I love numbers. I swear this is out of date and we don't have people on 1011. Please, Diana, don't kill me. Um, and it connects with a lot of other things like internal knowledge bases, dashboards. Uh, it's, we built a mobile version of it to help with any desk side support as well. So earlier on when I talked about the different values that Shopify believes in, this tool embodies almost every single one of those and has basically become an invaluable tool for my team. And it's totally homegrown. So you might be asking yourself, but Meg, how is your team able to take these scrappy and, let's be honest, crappy ways of doing things and actually start building for the long term without using a Post-it or a Google Sheet? Well, one thing we learned to do that really helped throughout this process was to deal with ambiguity better. And first, I want to acknowledge we have a long ways to go. Um, if anyone in the crowd has suggestions and stuff like that, feel free to approach me after and we can talk about them. But if you or your team have been here and you're kind of identifying with some of the stuff I'm bringing up, you know that there's so much ambiguity that comes along with growth at any size, whether it's 10, 20, or 200. And change can be super, super unnerving during this. But in order to learn to thrive on change instead of being afraid of it, I wanted to give you some of the tips that we learned. First, is everything is subject to change. Growing means that you are going to outgrow your tools and your workflows super fast. For some places, this occurs over years, maybe months. For some, like us, it can occur over weeks. It's all subject to change. What we started to do is we looked at each tool that we have in our system, and we support upwards of 200 tools on our team, and we planned out the trajectory for a lot of them. So we analyzed the health of our workflows, and we evaluated whether they would stand not only the test of time, but also the test of growth. How will this thing look like at like 3,000 people? How will it work at 5,000 people? Will it scale properly? What challenges might we foresee? This really helped. The second is learn to redefine things. So if we know that the things we support are going to change, our day-to-days are going to change too. So obviously the scope of your role during this time is probably going to change a little bit. I'm not going to advise this 100%, but if you go back to your environments and you take your job description and rip it up, that's probably what you should do because I guarantee you what you're doing today will be so much different than what you were doing day one. If your boss has a problem with this, send them my way. This is actually not a bad thing. So like I told you, we already, I mean, we had a really small team and in some ways we kind of still do. And that meant that everyone on the team was very much responsible for very, very, like a lot of stuff, right? So it was kind of a jack of all trades, master of none mentality. But as we grew bigger, we started to take the opposite approach and really encourage subject matter expertise. And we became masters of some instead of all. And the third thing is you don't know what you don't know. So by show of hands, how many people here have been in a meeting uh, where someone mentioned something and you nodded along as if you totally had a clue what they were talking about, but you obviously didn't? I think probably every one of us at some point. Obviously, we know this is called the imposter syndrome. Every single one of us has had it. We're probably even having it during this whole conference as well. But being vulnerable enough to admit that you don't know what someone is talking about is huge to your growth. Because chances are someone else in the room is feeling the exact same way and might not be brave enough to actually say something. So be a constant learner while you're growing. Make sure you ask questions. So once you've learned to deal with the things you can't see, what about some of the things that you can? There's this really great book called The Gray Rhino, How to Recognize and Act on the Obvious Dangers That We Ignore by Michelle Walker. And when this book is brought up, most often it's brought up in reference to the global financial crisis, which happened 10 years ago, or I guess it's more than a decade now. But the concept of the gray rhino is super, super applicable on how to handle growth. So it discusses the differences between a black swan and a gray rhino. So first, a black swan. Highly unpredictable, unforeseeable, chaotic, random. They're your system outages, an update that completely breaks something, or all of your team members calling in sick on the same day, which, believe it or not, is actually unplanned. But you can't predict when things like this will happen. Hopefully when you do, you've learned to deal with ambiguity enough that you can handle these types of curveballs. Now a gray rhino. We all know that phrase, the elephant in the room, right? So a rhino is obviously just as big, just as dangerous, but yet both of them completely go ignored. So gray rhinos are 
predictable. They're highly probable. They're capable of severe damage. Basically, they're your failure to acknowledge an issue with something, like not properly testing an OS and it breaks all of your dev environments. They're completely the result of a reactive mentality, not a proactive mentality. They're right in front of you the whole time, and you neglected them, just like we did with our repair and inventory issues. So when you spot a gray rhino, the first thing you have to do is don't do nothing, right? It's pretty obvious, but knowing that problems like this go ignored, we had to be really real with ourselves and identifying where our opportunities and weaknesses were and putting a plan in place to rectify them really fast. Basically, we learned to act like owners and stop a rhino in its tracks. And second thing is learn the nature of the beast. What are you dealing with? What are the risks if we change this workflow? How will users be affected? We all know this is QA. There's no excuse for not doing this. And the third thing is plan your safari really, really well. So creating a system of resolving our issues through things like project-based work and sprints actually allowed us to start shipping things faster. We implemented uh, recently an internal disruptions response plan, which adopts some similar kind of workflows to like a security incident. But what this allowed us to start doing is track these unexpected disruptions that come up, so those are your black swans, that prevent Shopify folk from being able to ship stuff. But it also lets us do things like postmortems to determine how can we prevent these things in the future. So it's kind of a black swan problem with a gray rhino mentality. But despite all the advice I'm giving you, things are still gonna break, right? But what if I were to tell you that there are some things that you'll encounter on this growth journey that will break, some things that won't break at all, but that the most important things will actually get stronger each time you break them. Kind of like a muscle. It's, uh, it's the concept of anti-fragility, and it's something that Shopify really, really embraces. Now, this concept centers around the theory that if you live your life in a way that allows you to be open to and embrace things like chaos and shock, that you benefit and grow. And you grow much faster than someone that does not do this. So most of us like to paint by numbers. We like to stick to the plan, and we like to follow the guidebooks. And this is considered to be really fragile. You avoid change. You're living in a constant state of what if. Um, and guess what? You're not growing. But the opposite is that you're robust. You're strong. You stand up to shock well. Nothing phases you at all. You go with the flow, right? Kind of like at the beginning when I was hugging that giant Corona bottle. You might think that this is actually the ideal way to be, but it's not, and you actually don't benefit from disruptors. So quite simply, again, you're not growing. Neither of these things is actually helpful or conducive to any type of growth. So there's a lot of examples of anti-fragility, things like you know, evolution, economy, AI, our repair management or lack thereof example. With that particular one, it took so many attempts of designing a system that didn't scale well, broke, was rebuilt, broke again, and each time it got rebuilt, it got stronger and stronger. Our system is not perfect, and I know that, um, but I look forward to continuing to break it to see how it grows. Now at Shopify, we love this type of thing. We love successful failure, and we actually give high fives for it. So I don't know how many people in the crowd can say that your workplaces give high five when you mess something up, but mine does, and we're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> So I know I'm giving you a lot of advice here and it's very like Oprah's Super Soul Sunday and whatnot. I don't have my own podcast, but in order to use this idea of anti-fragility to your benefit, there are a few things you need to keep in mind. And the first is that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Self-explanatory, we all know it. The second is don't try to predict the future. Just prepare for it. Learn to operate without that full picture, without the details. Spot the gray rhino and come up with a plan to handle it before it gets closer and closer. And the third thing is, do not reinvent the wheel. Using communities like things like Mac admins, Jamf Nation, conferences like this, they make us all anti-fragile. I think most people that present at conferences are probably referencing another person in the industry that helped them make something better. And that's awesome because we break and rebuild things on a daily basis. There's even people in this crowd right now that are basically legends for doing this type of thing. So I guess you could say the Mac admins that break together, innovate together. <laughs> so in the event that at the very beginning I kind of lost you and we talked a little bit about lazy rivers and drinks with umbrellas, uh, let me recap a couple things for you just to take away from my presentation. We learned about ambiguity and about how 
being able to act without all the information and about how being uncertain and being comfortable with risk can help you, not hinder you. Learn to get comfortable in rapid waters. They are going to take you where you want to go the quickest. Once you get comfortable dealing with the unknowns that face us every step of the way, learn to spot the gray rhinos in your environments. And finally, we learned about anti-fragility and how disorder and volatility can be a really good thing. So try start to introduce a little chaos in your day to day. It's a little bit more fun than you think. So to wrap things up, for all those moments where you felt like you were barely keeping your head above water, remember, those moments help create growth. And those are the moments that are going to help you not only today, but they're actually what's going to th take you through to tomorrow as well. Thanks. <laughs>